Welcome to the last day of Jizruk. It's gone really quickly. And this is our final keynote session, keynote number three. And I'm delighted to introduce you to uh, Sarah Lindley, who's a professor of geography in the Department of Geogra uh, Geography School of Environmental Education and Development in the University of Manchester. Um, so Sarah's gonna give her keynote speech on Beyond the Buffer, a short history of spatial analysis and exposure assessment. So it'll be about 45 to 50 minutes after which there'll be time for questions. And this um, keynote is interactive. So there'll be an opportunity to use Mentimeter um, partway into the, 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 the keynote speak. So I'm gonna put the link to Mentimeter into the chat and Sarah will tell you when to actually um, go there and do some voting. So I'll pass you over to Sarah. Um, hello, everybody, um, and thank you first to Scott and Cardiff University for the invitation to um, speak today. Um, when Scott um, approached me about this talk, I thought this would be um, a good opportunity to look back at um, how the spatial dimension has been uh, framed for exposure analysis, which is an area I've been working in um, for uh, around about 25 years now. So this um, field is actually quite large and varied and probably I have bitten off more than I can chew if I'm honest, but um, I hope that still you'll enjoy the bit of the tour and also um, thinking about uh, where we might go uh, next with exposure assessment. So as I say, it's a, a bit of an imperfect history, but I hope there's going to be something of, of, of interest um, to those of you uh, that are, are, are joining uh, joining us. So uh, before I start, um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, a number of um, direct or indirect con contributors to this, either through their research work or through slides that um, I've developed with them in the past, which I've kind of repurposed for the um, uh, presentation um, today. Especially I'd like to um, acknowledge Anna Malta um, and um, who I've worked with really for uh, 15 years or more, can't believe it's that long. Um, and more recently Labib who, um, uh, whose PhD work features quite heavily in parts of this uh, presentation as well. So a uh, special mention for, to Tim Minna Denwood, actually, who, um, who was the unwitting inspiration for the title. Um, only Tim Minna will probably get that and maybe Johnny, but there we go. OK, so um, as Scott has said, that I'll be I've got a, just a couple of interactive slides um, just because I know you've been listening to a lot of presentations. Um, so um, the mentee information for you, you, you can get via a mobile phone if you don't want to use your browser um, is, 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 is shown on the screen and in the chat as well. All right, so I'll get started because I've got rather a lot of material, so there may be some galloping at some point, but I'll give it a go. So no short history of any topic is is complete without reference to at least somebody from ancient Greece and also uh, the pioneering work um, of Dr. John Snow in this particular context. So any student of GIS will have come across the work of Dr. John Snow, so features very heavily in lots of GIS textbooks and so on. So obviously I needed to put that on my very, very first um, slide as well. So um, Hippo Hippocrates was, um, very much an advocate of space-time processes, um, considering the, the importance of seasons for health and also things that were peculiar to each locality. So obviously there is a very long history um, of, of this particular interest. And as I said, John Snow is of course um, famous not only from in GIS areas, but also as the father of epidemiology. Um, so I was actually particularly uh, thrilled to be able to go um, to a launch of, uh, actually it was the UK Climate Change uh, Projections pre-launch and find myself at the John Snow Lecture Theatre and in front of the specific, uh, the actual uh, pump itself, although I was slightly disappointed that there wasn't a map there um, of, of, of where the pump actually was originally. Um, I was going to use leave a post-it to that effect, but, 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 but anyway, I didn't. So let me start then with, um, I'll just give a quick overview of what I'm going to cover. 
So I'll start with a kind of brief framing of what we mean by exposure assessment. And then I'm going to give a bit of a potted history of some of, of, of developments of exposure assessment um, and particularly looking at obviously some of the spatial themes within that. Um, so that's based on kind of reviews of current literature and considering really then what are some of the remaining issues. The second part is going to focus more on um, preparing surfaces for exposure assessment with a particular emphasis on scale and this um, is, is, is informed by a lot of um, kind of, I guess, from my perspective, my change in interest in looking at things, not only with, from an air pollution epidemiology perspective, but also thinking about uh, wider benefits for things like from urban green space. So I'm going to conclude after that with um, a kind of what's next and brief summary. Okay. Uh -huh. Oops. I'm jumping forward, I'm going to have to be aware of that. So let's begin then with um, just a quick definition of what we need, mean by exposure assessment. So we're all on the same page. So we can see from the definition that um, exposure is very much a space time problem. And it's about a person coming into contact with a pollutant over a specified period of time. Now, of course, that pollutant could be any sort of environmental stressor. It might be noise, heat, ultrafine particles. It could be viruses, bacteria, ticks or mosquitoes. It could be something largely beneficial like urban green space. So the phenomena of interest is important, um, but the balance of things like space and time and how we sort of um, think about how the rel their relative in importance um, depends on um, not only the topic, but also how we kind of frame what we're, we're looking at. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is how we might balance space time analyses wouldn't only depend on something about whether we're looking at air pollution or um, some, like urban green space. It would also be framed by what kind of air pollutants we're looking at and so on. So in carrying out the um, exposure assessment, it's necessary to consider both the sp spatial and temporal variability of the pollutant or stressor or whatever we're looking at, and also think about the way that people interact with the environment. So this presentation is kind of going to look at both of those things. Um, and since this is exposure assessment and think, since this is kind of um, ultimately maybe going into things like health analyses, then um, it's actually quite common for these um, sorts of investigation to take place in quite wide interdisciplinary teams as well. So what methods are generally used then? So this depends a bit on um, perspective. And as I say, in, um, exposure assessment is in fact inherently um, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. So air pollution epidemiologists then would probably all like us to be able to use the gold standard of personal measurements of both um, as, as near as possible actual doses of um, the phenomena of interest and near actual responses. So the kind of um, the, the, um, the, the, the health outcome of interest. So this kind of gets would if, if it was possible to do this, then it would get around the space time problem by basically removing space and time um, for the purposes of analyses. So um, if you think about that, if you've got somebody like the, the lady here with the rucksack who's collected all of that information about the actual dose of something like air pollution, then um, you would get that as a, as, as, as a result that, we, that you could then use in lots of, of classical statistics. Of course, it's not actually that feasible to be able to do this because of uh, the cost of all of the equipment um, also possible um, risks, uh, how intrusive the methods are and, and also increasingly ethics as well. So that some of this might change with different monitoring technologies um, and there's obviously a lot of promise with things like low cost sensors, but um, they're not reliable quite yet enough. Um, to enable this kind of um, gold standard to be done. So at the other end of the spectrum then, um, some studies, particularly obviously early studies, um, instead 
kind of took it had to, had to kind of look at exposure in terms of um, central monitors or uh, the proximity to the nearest monitor. So this had the advantage of having a good temporal signal, but not particularly good for spatial elements of, of exposure. So it would have, it's obviously assume uh, the same sort of concentration profiles for a whole range of people that, that were um, in a particular area, only differentiated by that, 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 that distance to, to the monitor. So um, that's problematic for, uh, for, for uh, phenomena like um, uh, nitrogen dioxide, for, for example, which is quite spatially variant in, 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 in urban areas, even where that might work um, better for um, some um, uh, pollutants which are less spatially variant. And the other thing to bear in mind is that the monitors themselves were not actually um, cited with exposure in mind either. So um, even though increasingly that it looks like it might change, certainly a lot of the existing monitors, that is not the case. So there's this hierarchy of um, methods then and uh, GIS um, or spatial analysis techniques have a role to play in, in some of those. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about a particular case of, of land use regression modeling, just because that's been something that I've been working on uh, for, for a long time. Um, there are other ways, of course, of estimating pollutant surfaces. Uh, perhaps the one that needs noting is, is physical dispersion modeling, uh, but really that has never really been practical um, because of the extreme cost that um, are needed um, to be able to estimate for where people live, what the concentration values would be. So this is one of the reasons why um, air pollution epidemiologists have kind of looked for, for, for uh, cheaper and more efficient ways of, of generating um, exposure data. So here is my first interactive slide. So um, there was a review in 2012 of spatial methods used in epidemiological studies. Um, and they were taken from seven of the core epidemiology publications. So I'd like you to, for you to have a go at um, guessing uh, what proportion of studies you think used at least one spatial method in those seven core epidemiological studies. So I say this is just to give you a little bit of an opportunity for some interaction. So we're getting a big variation of uh, views here on what the, the uh, proportions might be. So just let me make a note of these. Okay, I am going to have to stop it here in the interest of time. Uh, but interesting, some very divergent views. <laughs> yes, quasi normal distribution indeed. <laughs> so uh, we'll pause this, we'll pause this here. And I'm going to ask you now, in that decade, which of these um, spatial methods do you think was the most popular um, in those um, uh, those publications that did have a, a spatial reference? And I should say this is these weren't just for air pollution epidemiology. I forgot to say that this is for any um, uh, health studies. So let's see how we've got. We've got 19 people at the moment on clustering, uh, 13 on proximity. OK, I'm going to pause there then and move on. So let's see, how did you do, folks? Well, I have to report that despite the quasi uh, normal distribution, in fact, only 1% of um, articles in that de de decade did in fact use spatial methods, 1%. That was 207 studies, but only 1% nonetheless. So quite astounding, actually, uh, which shows that although there's a lot of work that's been going on in this field, it's not, it, it, at that time, hadn't been making its way um, over particularly uh, strongly into epidemiological, core epidemiological um, research. And then look at the, the methods. So uh, I think our most popular one was clustering. 
but uh, by far the most popular one in the one in the this 207 um, was actually um, <laughs> proximity. So yeah, okay. So proximity was the thing that everybody was doing. Um, people were doing some aggregation as well, a little bit of interpolation, and then surprisingly, actually, uh, quite a lot of spatial regression as well. So um, obviously, that is a tradition that has been uh, taken forward as well. Okay, so moving on. Um, what this review probably rightly actually didn't particularly consider was the growing population uh, popularity rather of something called land use regression. So land use regression was developed from uh, interdisciplinary collaboration between um, uh, some GIS specialists um, and epidemiologists um, led by uh, David Briggs at Imperial College. And he um, published this in the International Journal of G GIS, so I think it was then. Um, and uh, re referred to this as regression mapping. Um, so it's actually um, got an enormous amount of popularity now. Um, and the epidemiological community started referring to it as, as land use regression. So that's kind of what it's, it's referred to a lot now. So it was really attractive because it was the basis for relatively quick, cheap and comprehensive exposure estimates, uh, which were far less likely to succumb to this misclassification issue of things like simple proximity um, measures. Now, um, actually, this is very much uh, just a global regression technique. Uh, not something that's particularly sophisticated geographically for what a lot of you folks have all been uh, working on. Um, however, it was um, useful because it allowed then a, a, a single regression equation to be developed, which could then be applied to a whole series of different receptor locations. So particularly things like people's homes. So it, it became really, really popular um, for that reason. So um, it was particularly suitable for uh, local pollutants because of this ability to get um, fine spatial variability and also for longer term averaging periods as well. So for, for long term health studies, really. And that's one of the reasons kind of I got involved with it as well, because of some of my work looking at, at that. So. Um, it was particular. I'm going to go quickly through these uh, particular slides because they're just giving you a bit of a sense of, of what this method did. Um, you can see here that uh, there's a, a lot of emphasis here on buffering, so buffering of road traffic flows and road characteristics and, and land cover, which is where the land use regression <laughs> came from, notwithstanding the issues between land cover and land use, but there we go. Um, and then uh, building that into the regression analysis that could then be gridded and, and used as a population map and as well of coming up with these uh, point source, uh, sorry, point uh, estimates as well for the, the receptor locations. So I think the next one, yes, uh, the next one is um, a review that was done in 2008 of uh, 25 studies at that point that have been using this approach. So um, the sorts of factors that were people were looking at were things like traffic representations, population density, land use, land cover, uh, physical geography uh, and, and climate. And some of these were, uh, most of them, in fact, were related to um, sources of um, emissions, uh, but a few were also related to sinks as well. So um, uh, green space um, is, is, is often comes up in these sorts of studies. So they're generally um, applied in North America and Europe because they do require uh, monitoring data to be in place. Uh, so there is that kind of uh, bias, if you like, in, in, in the studies, but there's still work ongoing about producing new predictive variables, doing these kind of analyses in different locations and also for different pollutants as well. So uh, some of the issues with this were that it's very um, study area specific. So the, the methods were being carried out in lots of different ways. Um, and this was problematic for, for looking at uh, comparability of um, health um, 
information or health study findings from one place to another. Um, as I say, monitoring site density was quite important um, and this was quite restrictive for some areas as well. And of course, it, as I said before, it's actually quite geographically insensitive. It's just basically an ordinary least squares uh, global regression um, approach. So, um, yeah. I should say at this point that we'll come back to the buffers. I should mention buffers. The buffer zones here, um, they were uh, theoretically informed, at least in principle. So although the literature talks about lots of different size buffer zones, um, there, are, there are some theoretical reasons why you would expect the different buffer zones to be used. So for, reason, for instance, you have these kind of micro scale processes at, at street level, and then you have these more city scale or background uh, processes as, as, as well, or at least if they're not processes, then uh, th those are different scales of which you would find uh, spatial variability in, in, in air pollution concentrations. So the different kind of buffer zones that were put into the, the models were an attempt to um, recognize that. Um, of course, the other thing of interest, and this will come back to the second half of the presentation as well, is that the decisions that were being made there were then obviously um, being recognised then in the neighbourhoods that were being used to estimate um, exposures as well. So, so there was that sort of interesting um, element from a sort of, you know, is, is that really uh, something that is, is, is ideal? So what sorts of uh, these, I'm going to go very, very quickly through these, but this just gives you an idea of some of the um, um, the variables that, that were, were put into the system. But I wanted to explore that a little bit more from the perspective of, of this project called um, ESCAPE. Now, ESCAPE um, was really used land use regression um, as, at the heart of the of a sort of holy grail, if you like, of trying to come up with a standardised exposure assessment methodology. So um, what this project did was to um, generate a standard protocol for processing data and also um, a standardised data set as well to use as the basis of, of generating these uh, city level regression um, equations. So the idea was that this would standardise some of the process in order to um, be able to provide a more uh, consistent basis for understanding air pollution exposure so that that could be plugged into analyses of, of health outcomes in, in 30 health cohorts distributed across Europe that you can see here. So um, the... The, it, there's lots and lots of publications, I think more than 40 publications from this particular project um, and uh, some of the predictor variables, I should say it was looked at NO2 and, and particulate matter, um, but here's a sort of summary of some of the predictor variables that were coming out um, across all of those different cities that were part of the uh, project. So um, you can see the influence of, of traffic um, uh, uh, variables, some within a very close distance and some um, further away, uh, and things like road length, distance to traffic, and, and by this point we're bringing in things like inverse distance weighting and um, as well as just um, general distance as well. So there was population um, density and so on, and also natural uh, green space featured in, in, in quite a few, but obviously not that much because we're talking about um, urban um, areas. So those were the kind of re regression predictors that were coming out. Um, and it was important, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but it was important, this study, um, because of the numbers of uh, participants that were were kind of in the study, if you like, um, and the fact that this showed um, quite um, in a convincing way, really, about the increased hazard ratio with in, in increasing concentrations. So linking um, natural cause mortality uh, with this, with these um, pollution um, causes. And interestingly as well, um, this showed that uh, the hazard ratio was also um, 
experienced where there was um, higher, uh, sorry, where the, the pollution concentrations are actually below the current thresholds at the time. So, so obviously that was really important in, in forming the next um, set of, of, of air quality standards as well. So because of this popularity, there's a lot of um, tools uh, that were developed for this. I don't want to talk lots about detail, but in lots of detail about this. But if you are interested to look a bit more about some of these tools, I just thought I'd, I'd put a slide up to show you. There have been developments since, so things like hybrid land use regression models. So they brought in um, uh, things like chemical transport model outputs, things like aer aerosol optical depth, and also started looking at things like moving windows as well, um, and making, making the estimates even more fine scale to, to a, a hundred meter uh, resolution, for example. And once we have these kind of aggression approaches, we can start doing lots of more interesting spatial analyses, really. Um, so here is um, a, just one example of a piece of work uh, that I did with, with, with Anna Malta, which was um, simulating, um, doing some, I think, 100,000 simulations of um, children's walking routes from home to school um, in order to see whether or not uh, we could um, make some recommendations about um, the time um, implications of selecting low pollution routes. So again, without having time really to go into a lot of detail here, um, we did find through using this kind of um, the, these inputs that um, we could find lower pollution routes quite frequently uh, without much of a time penalty uh, for that kind of walk to school. So, and of course, walking longer is, has other health benefits as well, as long as it's in a sort of low pollution um, environment. So that's just a bit about the uh, land use aggression. Now you're probably at this point, at this point thinking, uh, what's happened to all the different spatial regression methods? Surely they've been applied as well. Well, yes, of course, there are many um, different examples of those, um, but still a lot of those, I think it's fair to say, uh, do focus on, on kind of generating buffers, looking at proximities. And so, um, you know, that's worth bearing in mind. What are the implications of that? Still, a lot of that's done without very much prior knowledge of relevant buffer sizes. Um, and a, a lot of the time that they're, they're, they're put in and, and we see what, what comes out. And the other consideration as well is that a lot of this kind of work focuses on um, actually estimating pollution surfaces and not so much thinking about what then does this mean for exposure? What other considerations um, do we need to have in generating the actual estimate? So scale will be something um, that's relevant to that and that I'll come back to in, in the kind of second half second half, but I'm running out of time, so I'll have to move on. But I can't move on really without mentioning machine learning, because that's going to be another question that somebody's going to ask me. So um, there are just a couple of reviews that just just um, demonstrate that, that, as you'd expect, in the last few years, um, the uh, there's been a proliferation in the use of machine learning, uh, kind of widely conceived, I'd say. Um, a bit overlapping with some of the regression techniques, um, but again, some really promising um, findings as well. So looking at both estimation and forecasting as well. So, um, you know, obviously there's a big range of, of what's been looked at here, but a lot of uh, promising, um, fine, uh, promising uh, findings from those analyses. So if you are interested, I hope you took a screenshot of, of, of the slide itself. So um, here's just another one that's looking at uh, sensor-based uh, machine learning studies. And what's particularly interesting here is that this, this ability then to move into this finer time resolution. So one of the issues with uh, land use regression is that it doesn't work tremendously well unless you've got these longer term averaging periods that you're looking at. So this allows much better insight into the a high time um, resolution as well. 
Although it has to be said, here it is that only a small proportion of the, these studies actually have a kind of core spatial dimension. There's still a lot of them predicting at monitoring locations. So uh, proof of concept, I, I guess. One study that did um, stand out was this one, which is um, using random forests to um, estimate high spatial temporal resolution estimates, now high in a national scale, because this is uh, uh, one kilometre uh, for PM 2.5, but daily one kilometre PM 2.5 concentrations over such a long period is obviously um, um, very much of, in of interest. So, as I said, these outputs still require this consideration of the human interaction and don't necessarily deal with, with issues of, of scale, at least explicitly. So I am going to um, move on to that in a moment, but I have got one more mentee because I've been talking for a while. So one more mentee. What methods do you think then are the most exciting, promising from air, prom, exciting or promising from an air pollution exposure assessment perspective? Now I appreciate you're not air pollution exposure um, uh, specialists, but um, I'm just interested in taking a bit of a time. Um, timestamp really for for what you guys might think um, might be um, interested in or um, exciting at, at this point based on your kind of areas of specialism and what you know really about um, um, exposure assessments so we'll just we'll just give you a moment I'll catch my breath and get a um, a quick drink and maybe somebody will be able to pick up on this in 10 years time and see whether these uh, ideas really did um, uh, change how all these things have been done. So hopefully we'll post this. How are we doing time wise? Time's getting on. OK, thank you, everyone, for your input to this. You've exceeded my expectations of suggestions, I have to say. As you can see, machine learning up there, which um, is not surprising considering the graphs I showed earlier on, I guess. But agent-based modeling for exposure, yes. Lots of <laughs> sensors on pigeons, which has actually been done, but for um, temperature originally, I think. OK, I'm going to move on in the interest of time, but thank you for that. Some interesting ideas that I shall mull over at my leisure like later on. Lacanarity is coming up. I wonder if that's Labib. <laughs> we'll see. OK, right. So the second part of my talk is focusing a bit more on uh, the consideration of exposure itself. Um, and really, this is because a lot of my own work has been taking me in a slightly different direction away from air pollution um, exposure assessment. So uh, this is about unpicking um, some of the different contributions of urban green and blue spaces to um, health and well-being. Uh, now, obviously, some of these things are related to air quality. You saw that was a predictor variable, um, but this is looking much more broadly in a range of different sorts of um, health uh, benefits from um, urban green and blue spaces. So for there, I mean things like parks, river corridors, green roofs, gardens, canals, rivers, woodlands and street trees. So the, in exposure studies, all of these tend to be bundled as green space. So I will be using the term green space for that um, as well. So really quickly background, uh, just to let you know that there are these different ways that green spaces, now this is about biodiversity, but it's related to green space as well. That green spaces influence human health and wellbeing. Um, Firstly, reducing environmental stresses, which is kind of where I got interested in this area, but also things like res um, restoring capacities. So, um, you know, stress recovery and so on, um, and then building capacities as well. So encouraging things like physical um, activity. And there's been lots of studies that have shown things like the, the health 
impacts um, of, of green spaces more generally. And also, uh, here we've got percentage of, of health um, less than good um, with the percentage of, 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 of green space as well. So this, there's this idea of uh, green spells, greener areas being help, more healthy areas. So how should we consider exposure for green space areas then? If you think about what we looked at, if that be, at right at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about space and time and, and, and associations uh, with them. So uh, we could look at theoretically informed distances but as you can see from this illustration, just looking at these regulating ecosystem um, functions themselves, this is actually um, uh, quite complicated. There's loads of different um, ways that um, green spaces influence the urban environment or regulate the urban environment. Um, and this actually led to a particularly unfruitful period, I would say, of trying to establish, establish the spatial footprint of all of these different functions. Uh, but at the same time, it was um, a the foundation for building something that was a little bit more um, exciting. So, Labib's PhD work, which he's presented at, uh, just right before, um, was helping to set out some of the spatial elements of exposure um, from the perspective of exposure to elements of green infrastructure and understanding how we can map and model um, exposures. So this framing was really based on three different pathways. So looking at um, availability of green spaces. So this was particularly linked to things like uh, re these, those regulating functions, um, you know, the areas were quieter, less polluted, cooler in summer and so on. Um, also looking at um, a pathway that was related to accessibility. So this sort of indicated things like physical, you know, more propensity for physical activity in places that were closer to green spaces. Uh, and of course, the ability to be directly immersed in, 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 um, in, in green spaces. And then finally, visibility. Um, that was uh, dealing with these sorts of other intangibles uh, associated with indirect um, contact with nature. We also considered the different ways that previous studies had been framed spatially in this idea of green space exposure um, assessment. So note that the situation here was actually quite different to the air pollution case because um, in air pollution epidemiology, uh, it was necessary to make estimates for the air quality uh, for areas that didn't have them because most areas didn't, there was no information about the, the um, air quality um, uh, concentrations. So here, you know, in contrast in the spatial, uh, sorry, in the green space studies, there were numerous available um, surfaces of green and blue spaces to work with, uh, NDVI, uh, LAI, sort of leaf area index, um, and, and land cover um, assessment as well. So perhaps it was more important to start considering um, how to use those in a sensitive way and how to think about um, how people interacted uh, with those surfaces as well. So we looked at the literature, 93 individual studies, um, and looked at things like the uh, units, the neighbourhoods that were being considered. So the vast majority of those were based on uh, the simple buffer. Um, and then we looked at buffer distances that people uh, were using as well. Um, and there was a big variation in those um, as well. So you can see that from the graph here. And um, there was then the sort of got us thinking about what are the impacts of choosing these different um, um, spatial uh, buffer zones and, and, and what, how might scale impact all of this, considering that we, we have uh, the surfaces already that we're working with. So we did look at a whole series of other things as well, but I don't have time to talk about those right now. And I'm going to skip over this next slide as well quickly so that I can move on to talk about what this review then um, stimulated. So um, the review helped stimulate two kind of breakthroughs. The first was to, to consider the concept of lacunarity in um, this specific context of exposure assessment. 
um, which we don't think we, we couldn't find that had been done before. And the second was then to, com to use the findings from a lacunarity uh, analysis to develop a multi-scale composite map, which combined the different data together in a scale sensitive way uh, that were then going to be um, efficient for uh, the process of estimating exposures afterwards. So it also came at a time when um, other parts of my work, working with people like Matt, like Matt Dennis, had uh, developed quite fine scale resolution data of um, green um, infrastructure and it, its characteristics. So it was a really good time to be looking at this. So I mentioned like a narrative, but I haven't said what it is. So um, this is a scale dependent measure of the heterogeneity of images based on the principles of fractals. So we use this concept to try and address the issues of inconsistent scales and buffer distances that I alluded to before. And um, we did this in relation to three different green space related metrics that were relevant for exposure assessment. Okay, Sarah, you've got about five minutes. Thank you. So um, the lack of narrative results then. Um, so we're able to estimate from these are lack of narrative results that were processed and we were able to estimate an upper distance threshold. Uh, well, not so much for the land use, uh, land use, land cover uh, one here. That was a little bit, that was a binary layer, so it's slightly different. But we were able to uh, generate basically estimate a, a, a general um, upper distance threshold above which each green space metric became invariant due to landscape homogeneity. And from this, prepare um, an exposure index map using the weights derived from the lacunarity um, analysis. So here's um, the, um, what we then did, yeah, we generated these uh, individual maps for each of the commonly used metrics and then combine those into um, a composite that you can see here. Now you're probably thinking, so what at this point? <laughs> so what was really interesting was that we really didn't know what was gonna happen when we looked at this issue of scale and you know, would this then cause lots of, um, you know, what will be the impact then if we were going to try and look at sort of health outcomes and look at how this maps spatially across a particular area. So all of this work, by the way, has been Greater Manchester, and I hope that's been obvious. But what we did was we looked at um, how this composite then um, estimated exposures for uh, neighbourhoods, so LSOAs uh, with different uh, different um, um, multi different deprivation um, profiles. And what we found, and this is kind of a take home message really, was that when we did this correction for scale, we also found that this differentiated exposures more than just using the, um, the, the, the basic metrics um, themselves uh, or the scale um, weighted um, metrics for, for each of the, um, uh, each of the indicators separately. So that here you can see the, um, these are the lowest deprivation, so, sorry, the highest deprivation areas. Um, and we see that we get quite a lot of differentiation here. So this was quite exciting because um, this differ differentiation then might explain um, health, the different health outcomes in those areas as well. So Labib did a lot of work on, on the other pathways which um, I'm not going to speak about. Um, but what we did find through that, I'll just go quickly back to that, was that um, we found through doing this analysis that um, there was very much the potential for explaining um, these, these differences in health as well. So um, much better at, at correlating with things like years of, of life lost. So lots of promise in this. And more recently, like over the last couple of weeks, actually preparing for this, this is my second to last slide, don't worry. Um, we started to think about, okay, so how is lacunarity spatially varying? So this is important because um, obviously different cities have different sorts of urban uh, fabric and so on. 
So how did this uh, lacunarity and potentially then the scale effect um, vary in different contexts within um, our area of interest and therefore what might the implications be elsewhere? So you can see that um, the, the um, scale, the, the invariance um, sort of threshold in the built up dominant areas is actually really quite small. So the next stage really is to have a look in a bit more detail at this spatially variant scale effect and see if we can build this into the models as well. So in conclusion, um, this is short history has shown an evolving picture of GIS applications in exposure assessment, seeing some challenges and opportunities, but also some persistent issues as well. Um, talk us through the, the development of these scale sensitive um, exposure index maps, initially to look at health and well-being related to green infrastructure, but um, I hope you can see that this has got promise then for look, looking at these other landscapes of interest. So now we have these um, much more refined air pollution um, landscapes. We can now start looking at the lacunarity characteristics of those um, and hopefully build that scale impact in um, that scale sensitivity into those layers as well. And of course, it will be interesting to, tr to explore the translation of some of this into different urban contexts and, and how to handle this geographical scale variability as well. So, okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope I haven't overrun too much. Okay, that, that's great. Um, thank you, Sarah. No, we've got uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, and in fact, one's already come into the Q&A. Um, could you show the slide with the different land use regression libraries and software? So, um, Sarah, could you go just go back and, and leave that slide up, the one on the different land use regression libraries, so people can take screenshots of it? Okay, I can do that, she says yeah. confidently. <laughs> I'll whiz <laughs> just, just, whiz, just whiz back. Um, yeah, I'll just whiz back. Okay, I'm going to ask you one. Um, I don't know whether it's surprising or not that only 1% of the papers uh, in epidemiology used a, a, a spatial method. Um, is there any indication that this is improving over time um, as more people are being exposed to, to spatial methods and, and the, um, the software is, is generally becoming more available or, yeah. or is it just something that, that that's going to be persistent? Um, I think there's, there, it's fair to say that there's a, um, a hard call um, <laughs> that uh, of epidemiologists and uh, that do work closely with, with more from the geographical information science perspective and, and they have um, actually co-authored a few of those more recent that that, that UK um, map that I showed you that was co-authored with people that have worked in these big epidemiological teams so I think that yes that that is changing to some extent um, and I'd also say that air pollution epidemiology of the 1%, I think 30% of those papers were from air pollution epidemiology and climate related applications. So that's very much a forerunner, but I suspect in other areas of epidemiology, it's probably, I mean, I'm guessing to some extent, but <laughs> um, in other areas of epidemiology, probably there is a bit more scope to be developing these ideas, but yes. This is coming out through collaboration with, with spatial scientists and health and epidemiology and health, health, health experts, is that? Yes, but probably we could do more, I think, as a community to make those mm. engagements across, I definitely think. Um, and, you know, perhaps, perhaps this is the time to do another review, I guess, and, and have, have a look. It's not something that I had a chance to do in preparation for this, but it, it is something I think that would be worthwhile doing. Uh, maybe it's time for um, this community to be leading some of the analyses as well and, and bringing the epidemiologists in rather than the other way around. Um, mm. So that would be something that maybe somebody on this, on, on this, on this call now will be able to take the lead with. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it the case that epidemiologists tend to be statisticians and therefore um, aren't really exposed to um, spatial statistics? 
um, and the spatial statistics maybe aren't rigorous enough for the epidemiologist to use. Um, uh, as, as, that, Lex, as Lex has just said, epidemiologists in his experience are not interested in new methods. So it is this sort of being wedded to a set of tools you've already using. Yeah, um, I think that's true, but it's kind of a curious situation really, because what I always, when I started working with uh, epidemiologists, you know, they are, yes, classically trained statisticians. What they really want is a simple number to plug into their power calculations and, you know, to do the power calculations, all that um, very classical statistics work. But they, in a way, they were less interested in this sort of spatial errors. And again, we can maybe um, help them a bit more by coming up with probability, you know, PDFs, uh, mm, probability mm. density functions of exposure characteristics as well. That's another um, whole area that, that we might be able to um, interest them in that they can plug into them, their models as well. <laughs> yeah. Lex has got a very interesting image of us riding around in a methodological spaceships and they're still on their penny farthings because they're still like Jon Snow um, <laughs> cycling for Victoria London <laughs> okay Kate, Caitlin's asked you know, who says fantastic talk you mentioned different footprints when thinking about the relationship between green space and different types of exposure like no noise pollution and the complexities of understanding these footprints. Yeah. Um, could you expand on this a bit? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> there was there was a what what we were trying to do, Caitlin, was um, try and really provide that idea of what's the sort of spatial diffusion of the benefits of different um, green spaces. So going back through the, all of the literature and trying to come up with um, what is the sort of the, the, the distance um, that you can expect that these benefits would diffuse over. So it was kind of flipping it on its head a little bit um, by them, rather than thinking about green spaces as being kind of sinks, rather than thinking about where, where do the benefits spread, except that became so complicated with uh, different sorts of contexts. Uh, we kind of did give up on that a bit, but, um, and again, uh, there are people on this call, I'm sure, who uh, will remember very, very clearly uh, the, the efforts that, that, that went into that. Now, that's not to say that this is not something that would be interesting to do. It, it's simply that um, it, it's quite, it was a, a basically an entire sort of PhD in its own right, I think, to come up with this. But maybe it will be an interesting PhD to provide those footprints at some point. So that was a bit of a rambling explanation, Kate, but it was about um, really just thinking that we knew that things, places like parks had this kind of cooling um, zone around them. And it was about trying to sort of capture, see if we could capture what that was on a sort of city scale. Okay, but there's another question in the question and answer. Um, when you study green space, did you distinguish between different types of green space such as their size? Um, good question, did we? Well, I suppose that's built in a little bit into the lacunarity um, analysis a bit more because of that looking at the heterogeneity of the landscape would incorporate some of those, those elements. Um, and I guess we, you know, just thinking back to what we were just saying in, in response to Kate's uh, comment, that, um, yeah, I mean, it would come out particularly importantly if we were going to look at um, that sort of spatial footprint idea, that would be very much determined on the, um, you know, determined from the size sizes. But here, what we're doing in that last part of the, of the presentation was, was looking at that landscape. So it would be incorporating already what the different sorts of sizes of, of spaces were. So I guess that will be um, covered already in the analysis. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a really interesting talk. Um, Thanks for everyone for your, for your attention. Um, yeah. for Thank you. Okay. Okay, see everybody. <laughs> I like my new look as well. <laughs>